Hi, I'm Jamie. And hello, I'm Luke. And this week we'll be looking at nature close to your home. We've got birds to look at and to listen for, a guide to cleaning your bird feeders. And first of all, we're going to be looking at some of the wonderful photos that you've been sending in to the Nature's Home inbox. So it's been absolutely wonderful seeing all the pictures that you've been sending in. And we're going to kick off with this incredible moth. Now, a lot of us don't think about seeing moths at this time of year, but actually there are quite a lot around. And Herald is a moth that lives for a very long time. So it's an autumn species that this time of year will be looking for somewhere to hibernate. And they will survive all the way through to the spring. And that's actually where they get their name from, the Herald. So they herald in the spring, as it were. So a great species. And actually, that's a really superb uh, picture. I really, really like that, how it's kind of posed. But ordinarily, it'll be looking to kind of tuck itself in in some rocks. And, you know, they're classically found in, in things like caves in winter as well. But in a garden closer to your home, more likely a shed. What an incredibly beautiful moth. And another species that I think most of us will agree is beautiful is the hoopoo. And as you can see, I'm quite fond of hoopoos. This picture was taken by Jane Farrer, and she says it was the highlight of her year so far when she went to see the hoopoo near Weatherby. And she said it, it was the case for her that it was local and the chance to see one for her might never arise again. What a stunning bird this is. There's actually been one near me this week in Bedfordshire, but I've not had the chance to go and see it. But if you do find out there's a hoopoo near you and restrictions allow and you can include it in your daily exercise, do go and see it. Now, Luke, hoopoo shouldn't be here, should they? They've blown off course during migration. Will, will these birds find their way back down to the south of Europe again? Um, yeah, it, it's possible. So hoopoos are a really interesting one because they do turn up more often in the spring because they're pushing their way north from Africa into Europe and some of them overshoot their migration, they, they go too far. Um, in the autumn, it's a really unusual one because they should be heading south. So they basically migrated the opposite direction. So, I mean, some birds do reorientate themselves and head back south. Um, I mean, you know, in the reality of things, some don't, but, you know, a big bird like a hoopoo, they're strong flyers, you know, there's every hope that it'll get back to Africa. And we've got another bird here, I think, which is another migrant species. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this one? So yeah, we've got a purple sandpiper, which is a real winter bird for me. It's one that I really enjoy going to look for in the autumn and winter. Uh, they breed up in the high Arctic. Um, they come to the UK in winter in, in relatively small numbers. It's not a wader that you see in massive flocks. You know, if you think of not at Snettisham or something where there's hundreds of thousands, um, you're never going to see hundreds of thousands of purple sandpiper. It's always going to be just a handful. And they love rocky coastlines. So this one was taken at um, Titchwell. So I imagine there's a rocky coastline around the edge of Titchwell where they're going to be hanging out for the winter. But they're seen all around the UK. So I'm down in Dorset and I've got them uh, virtually on my doorstep in Lyme Regis and Portland Bill is another place I get to see them. Um, but they're found all across the country. So, you know, it's a bird that you don't have to travel very far at all to see if you live near the coast. And for those of us who struggle a bit with waders, Luke, what's the way that we can identify a purple sandpiper? Are, is, are they quite sort of purpley? Is that what we're looking for? Or are they in winter plumage so it makes it harder? So it's a, it's, a, it's a strange one. They're not actually purple, as you can see from the picture, but there is a slight purple sort of hue to them. It, it's just ever so subtle. Um, and it's the, the colour of them blends in with rocks and that, that's where they like to hang out on the rocks. Um, but in terms of identification, um, you know, got the, the orange legs and that sort of greyish, brownish, slight purplish colour, um, nice little down curved beak. Um, but the habitat gives it away, the fact that they live on those, you know, really rough, rocky shorelines. There's not a lot of waders apart from probably turnstones that you're likely to see in that sort of habitat. So that's a real good clue. We've got a couple of lovely photos now of uh, things people have been doing in their gardens to look after wildlife. And Phil Gardner has adapted an old rotary clothesline to make his recycled feeding station. And of course, you can buy these types of feeders from the RSPB. But this is quite clever because you can hook your feeders around the edges. You've not thrown a piece of plastic and metal away into into the into the rubbish and the birds are using it. So fantastic. Well done, Phil. 
And this picture was sent in by Janet Smith, who spent a fantastic morning with her granddaughter, Connie, who's aged eight. And they've made this hedgehog house. Now you can see it's stuffed full of leaves and twigs, which is a really good sign. Hopefully there's a hedgehog inside, tucked away, nice and cozy. And of course, the temperatures are dropping outside at the moment. So there's a high chance that this hedgehog is hibernating. So uh, hopefully it's nice and cozy in there and it's a lovely, peaceful spot. But fantastic effort and thanks for the image. Do keep an eye out for hedgehogs. Um, if you do see any during the day, get in touch with um, the uh, British Hedgehog Preservation Society. They do have local rescuers if you have a concern about a hedgehog that you're seeing. And of course, you can make homes from the new garden just like that. And they, they like a tussock. They like little clumps of leaves and logs that they can nestle away in for the winter. Now, this series of photos was taken by Jerry Bennett and he sent with it um, a fantastic little commentary. He was watching a grey heron attempting to eat a very large fish. And the story begins with this rather glorious, stately looking heron standing ankle deep in the ooze. Um, and this is by the Linklater Pavilion Railway Land Nature Reserve right in the heart of Lewis. And uh, he, was, he was captivated by this. Obviously, they're, they're great things to watch when they're on the move. A lot of the time, herons just stand very still. But when you actually see them moving around, you know they're about to snatch something from the water and it gets quite exciting. So the heron spotted this large fish and grabbed it, it got it in its beak and was trying to get it down the neck. But the fish is clearly too big. Its eyes are too big for its stomach, the heron, so it was struggling. So Jerry decided that the only solution the heron had was to call a friend, like who wants to be a millionaire. And some other birds came to help. So uh, a couple of gulls come along, um, an adult plus a juvenile apprentice, Jerry says. They can't swallow either, but they can actually break it up a little bit for the heron. So the heron lets them get on with it for about 10 minutes. And this process was repeated several times over two hours with the heron gate crashing the process occasionally to carry out an assessment on how the gulls were doing. Um, and eventually the fish's head was hanging off. The heron managed to get hold of it and down the hatch it went. And Jerry says, watch out for the bones. So um, that was an interesting little um, bit of teamwork eating that fish there. Slight change of subject now. We all know that we need to keep our bird feeders clean in our gardens to keep our garden visitors healthy. Here's a quick guide on how to do this. So here's how you clean your bird feeder. This RSPB one is quite good because I can take the bottom off for easy cleaning. And this usually needs a little bit of a scrub because our bird feeders get a lot of use. So I'm just taking all the little components off here, the little perches. And this goes into a bucket of soapy water. Lid gets a bit mucky as well, so I can make sure I get that good swill. Now I've got a bottle brush for this, which makes life a lot easier because you can clean right inside the tube. But if you don't have one, you can always just swill the inside out with some soapy water instead. I give a particular attention to the areas where the birds are perching because obviously that gets the dirtiest. So that's the, the main bit. And then the little bits, the little perches and the, and the end bit as well. A little bit of a scrub around here. And then usually I will rinse them with some um, clean water afterwards just to get the soapy suds off. And this can usually be dry in probably an hour or so. And I can refill it and I can pop it back up because I can hear the birds <laughs> gathering around me and they're very, very hungry. These, they get to the sunflower seeds really quickly. That's the lot. So um, let that dry after rinsing it, put it back together and you're good to go. Now, although I wasn't wearing them in the video, we do recommend that you wear gloves for this. Check your hands for any cuts or scrapes if you're not wearing gloves and do wash your hands very thoroughly afterwards. And the advice from our wildlife inquiries team is that you should clean your bird feeders at least every two weeks, but you can clean them as often as you like. Something else we might be doing at this time of year in our garden is tidying up our hedges. I asked Anna in our wildlife inquiries team what the best way of doing this is to avoid disturbing wildlife. Yeah, so we, we do get asked about hedge cutting quite a lot throughout the year. And as you say, um, we often recommend that hedges aren't cut in the main bird breeding season, which is usually March to September. So by the time it gets to October, November, people are they're ready to cut their hedges. So as long as there are no birds nesting in your hedge, then you are legally absolutely fine to cut the hedge. Um, I'd say at this time of year, the only birds that are really likely to be nesting um, would be pigeons, um, but it is important to double check first. Um, and then as far, as far as the wildlife is concerned, as long as you're doing it in the most wildlife friendly way and causing as least disturbance as possible, then you would be okay to cut your hedges at this time of year. You can join in with our Breakfast Bird Watch on Twitter between 8 and 9am every weekday using the hashtag Breakfast Bird Watch. 
So one of the great things about birds is that you can listen to them as well as watching them. And here's a way you can do that. At night, while we're sleeping, thousands of birds are continuing their epic migration journeys overhead. But what could they be? I'm going to do a bit of investigative work using a parabolic dish, a digital recorder, leave them recording overnight and then play them back tomorrow and see what we can find. Well, I recorded about five hours of sound last night and I picked up the odd plane, distant trains, a few dogs barking, late night traffic, and of course, the odd firework or two because it's that time of year. But I also got recordings of plenty of birds. And one of the ones I'm most excited about is the red wing because that's what I would expect to hear at this time of year. It's got a very distinctive call, that high pitched seep sound, and a distinctive shape on the screen here, which I've compared with some audio from the Xeno Canto website. Now, the resources I'm using here are free. Audacity is a free piece of software. It's fairly easy to use. Xeno Canto is a great website, a fantastic resource with bird calls from all over the world. So you can compare what you're recording. And of course, you can check with more knowledgeable people on social media as well. And I found people are always willing to sort of chip in and give you some advice and suggestions as to what you might have recorded. It's great fun, so I would thoroughly recommend trying this out and seeing what's flying over your house at night. Now, as well as recording red wings, I also picked up the calls of song thrushes and blackbirds flying over at night. These aren't birds that you might typically think of as being migratory species, especially blackbirds. I actually got three or four in a flock flying together. Luke, what's going on there? Where were these song thrushes and blackbirds coming from? Presumably further east? Um, yeah, absolutely, Jamie. So, I mean, nighttime is, it, there's there's basically all sorts going on overhead. Um, nighttime is when it's safer for birds to migrate. So everything takes advantage of that. Um, so blackbirds, song thrush are common ones, red wings, as you say. Um, but you might be really surprised at what will fly over, over your garden at middle of night. I mean, I've got friends who do this quite regularly and they set, you know, these these parabolic dishes up in their gardens. And, you know, some of them live you know, 40, 50 miles inland, and they, they pick up the sounds of wading birds, you know, things like golden plover, lapwing, um, snipe, dunlin, or, you know, all sorts of things that you just wouldn't expect to be flying over at night. Um, but like I say, it's, it's all about being safer. Um, you know, in the daytime, there's, there's predators like peregrines that would be out hunting. So, you know, under the cover of darkness, you're going to be safe. Owls don't tend to fly too high at night. <laughs> they sit in the trees just, you know, waiting to, uh, to pounce on whatever's below them. They're not really looking up. So, yeah, safe time to migrate. And of course, you don't need recording equipment to enjoy hearing birds flying over at night. Simply open your door, step outside and listen. And one of the species that's really, really easy to hear right now is the red wing. So let's find out a little bit more about the red wing uh, with a species spotlight that I did just the other day. Now, interestingly, the red wing on the red wing doesn't actually stand out that much. It's actually the underwing, it's not the wing itself. For me, one of the most striking features are the supercilium, which is the white stripe above the eye. There's not a lot of other thrush species in the UK that have that very striking feature. So where are the red wings coming from? Well, they're all from Scandinavia and probably into Russia as well, but there is also a population from Iceland that migrate down to the UK and the Icelandic birds are a little bit bigger and a bit darker looking, so you can actually tell them apart if you've got a very, very keen eye and you get an incredibly good view. Uh, now, like I say, they're from Scandinavia mainly and they head this direction basically in search of food. Um, they don't have a spot that they tend to winter in. Um, they're going to be moving around all winter. So that's a really good thing from our perspective because that means we can see them at any time of, of uh, over the next few months, really. So, um, yeah, keep an eye out, you know, in gardens, particularly if it gets cold. Um, if you get a real hard frost or even snow, red wings will sometimes congregate in gardens. And that's often associated with having apple trees because they're favorite food at this time of year. Apart from berries, as we saw in the video earlier on, um, they absolutely love rotting apples and orchards particularly can be a great place to find the red wings. And also you get field fares as well, but that's another species for another day. Now let's revisit that sound because it's incredibly important. If you're going to be going out looking for red wings or going out at night listening for them, that sound is crucial. So it's well worth trying to get that sort of ingrained in your mind. Um, but yeah, let's just take another listen to that sound right now.
you can see it's, it's, it's pretty distinctive. It's, it's always a down slur, it's always quite high pitched. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a relatively easy one to, uh, to hopefully pick out on a, on a dark, cold night if you're brave enough to head out over the next, uh, next few weeks. They are wonderful birds, Luke. Is there a way that we can attract them to our garden so we can get a better view? So this is a bit of a challenge, and uh, and, and like I mentioned in the, in the video, there they're a bird that is, they're very mobile. Um, they travel all across the country throughout the winter, searching for food. So you know it, it is all about food. And again, I mentioned orchards, and you know so some people may have an apple tree in the garden that's got a few apples underneath. So it's well worth leaving those apples there to see if you can attract one. But the thing is, you know, is looking out for that cold weather. Um, I've experienced some winters, um, particularly near the coast, you know, where I live in, in Dorset, uh, where, you know, if it's below freezing for any length of time, birds get extra mobile because food is harder to find. So, you know, I've seen big flocks of red wings heading into gardens during really snowy periods. They are wonderful things to watch, these colourful northern and eastern thrushes that arrive with us in winter. And something that's also really enjoyable to watch is this relaxing video that's on our YouTube channel now from RSPB Scotland. Here's a little clip, but do tune in and watch the full thing and enjoy. To me, it is really serene and peaceful, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, you've got all the autumn colours of the trees. It's magnificent. Um, the variety of colours, I just, well, I just don't think I could start to describe that, really. And it's, um, to me, being in a wild place like this and being in a rainforest, it's good for my soul. And I think particularly in these, this year with COVID, it's um, being able to come out to places like this because I live relatively close to it, to me is just a wonder. And you can watch the full version of that wonderful little film at youtube.com slash RSPB video. So if you cast your minds back to that rather unusual summer, um, you may not want to. But one of the highlights, uh, at least, was that a lot of our, our events still happened online. And one of the big highlights for me this summer was the virtual bird fair. Now, I love talks about wildlife and birds, all sorts of things like that. If you do too, um, they are going to be available on their website until the end of the year. So well worth a look. And these include talks by some of our RSPB colleagues, like Jolene Hughes' fascinating talk about connection to nature. Plus, I'll be there as well um, back in the summer when there were leaves on the trees, uh, checking out some incredibly colourful and fascinating moths with Phil Sterling. And there's also the careers clinic looking at different conservation careers and my interviews with various key people from the world of wildlife. Do check it out. They're all online at virtual.birdfair.org.uk. We hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Do get in touch if there's anything you'd like us to cover in our future videos. You can comment underneath wherever you're watching this video or email us at natureshome at rspb.org.uk. So thanks for watching and we will see you next time.